So this is part two. Now we're talking about the platyhelminthes, the flatworms. And now we're going to talk about these other classes that are parasitic. So our first class, the uh, turbillaria, those were the free-living flatworms. They can live on their own. And then within there, we've got the planarians, which are the freshwater versions that we're going to look at in lab. The rest of these classes are all parasites. And um, a lot of them are parasites of vertebrates. Um, so humans can get them or livestock can get them. And so I'm going to try to give you some of those uh, interesting examples. The first class of the trematodes, class trematoda. And um, there's lots of important human parasites in here. Uh, a lot of the parasites in this class are endoparasites. Remember, endo means inside. And so these are inside parasites. They're parasites inside your body. Um, and later on, we'll talk about exoparasites or external parasites that are on the outside of the body. A common term for this class are the flukes. And so you hear a lot about, you know, liver fluke or blood fluke. This is what they're talking about. It's a flatworm. And it's in the class Trematoda, so it's also called a Trematode. Many of these have a complex life cycle that involves several different organisms and several different hosts. And you have the intermediate host versus the, the definitive host. And if you take parasitology, you'll get into a lot more detail about this. But um, you have several different life stages that occur in different organisms. And then the organism in which sexual reproduction takes place, that's called the definitive host. And for a lot of these disease-causing flukes, understanding that life cycle helps you control them. You can remove an organism that's part of the life cycle and you break that life cycle. Um, there are lots of different stages, like I mentioned, spread out over many hosts. And so you've got, um, You've got the, uh, you know, the adult, and then uh, they lay eggs. You've got a, a myricidium, and then that forms a sporocyst, and those can um, hatch into redia, and then cercaria, and then metacercaria. These are all possible different life forms of uh, flukes. Now, they're not always all present. And so some organisms are going to have all these stages. Some are only going to have some of these stages. The important thing to understand is that you've got this complicated life cycle that goes through these different stages and cycles back, but it often requires different uh, species to host the different stages. And so here's an example of that. This is the human liver fluke, um, which can be a parasite of humans. Of course, it lives in the liver. And you can see in this uh, figure from your book how it shows the many different forms. And so you've got, uh, you've got the adult that lives inside the human liver, and then it sheds eggs. And then those eggs um, can be eaten by a snail and then hatch into a, a myricidium and, and can form a sporocyst and redia. And then eventually that snail will expel the cercaria which can swim and infect a fish and become metasacaria. And then if a human eats that infected fish that's undercooked, then that completes the life cycle. So you see all these different stages spread out over different species. Um, a lot of the times a mollusk is an intermediate host for these flukes. And so you'll see that in a lot of the examples that I give, that there you know, might be a sheep or a cow um, that is the determinate host, but a lot of times the intermediate host is a mollusk. And, and do, I, do I know why that is? No, I suspect it has a lot to do with a lot of these you know, snails, mostly, that live in water. And a lot of the life forms of the fluke depend upon water, and so here's a host that's always found in water. That's probably got something to do with it. You'll also notice that um, the sporocysts when it's in the mollusk, can reproduce asexually. And so it can make clones of itself. And so the sporocysts can make more sporocysts. And those sporocysts can also reproduce asexually to make a bunch of redia. And so the point of this is, is that the uh, redia can then also reproduce asexually to produce a cercaria. And these all could come from a single egg. And so you got one egg that can produce a ton of sporocysts that can reproduce, and they can produce a ton of redia that can reproduce, and the redia can reproduce into cercaria. And so you can multiply 
the number of potential um, juveniles just from a single egg. Now, um, the cercaria, like I said, when they get into a fish, they're called metacercaria, and these are often visible when you're dissecting fish. When we dissect fish later, we're going to look for some of these things. Those are juvenile flukes. And so then if those flukes get eaten by the definitive host, then they can migrate to the site of infection. They can metamorphosize into adults. You have sexual reproduction, produce eggs, the eggs are shed, and you complete the cycle. Um, often this is the result of eating uncooked or undercooked meat. You know, by cooking the meat, you destroy those cysts and then they don't become as dangerous. Um, so here's a figure from your book, just kind of showing you the general anatomy of a human liver fluke. And so what I want to do is just draw your attention to the similarities between this and those planarians we looked at in the last lecture. They're both flatworms, right? So they're flat. They've got a lot of surface area so they can exchange gases across their surface. But you see more complicated organ systems here. You see reproductive systems. You see nervous systems. Uh, you see a nervous system in this one. It looks like nerves there. Um, you've got digestive system. Um, so you see there's a little bit more complexity, but it's very similar to their relatives, which are the planarians. Um, now, these things can reside in the bile ducts of a human liver for up to 30 years. So you could be carrying this thing for a long time and have it parasitizing you, um, which is kind of gross, but it's also kind of cool. And as I mentioned, usually you um, contract this by eating undercooked meat, and usually it's fish from the family Cyprinidae, which are the minnows. And so these um, flukes don't infect all species of fish equally. And so I worked with a buddy of mine before and we looked at a, a, a grub or a fluke that lived in the Centrarchidae, which are the sunfish, it's a different family of fish. But usually the human liver fluke you're gonna find in uh, Cyprinidae. And if you eat those, um, an undercooked version of that, you might complete the life cycle. Um, here's just another picture showing that same liver fluke and showing that same cycle. And uh, you see you got the, the mollusk host and the fish host um, are both important um, to complete the cycle where the adult lives in the human liver. And uh, I'll show you a video of a surgeon using um, endoscopy to remove a liver fluke. I'll show you that in lab. Uh, here's an example I just found from the internet, which I thought was cool. Somebody who shot a deer, and they were butchering the, the deer, and they cut open the liver. And here are liver flukes that they found in a deer. And again, you can see the uh, similarity. You can see it's a flatworm. You see the similarity in shape and, and morphology to the other flatworms we've looked at. Um, so this is just a different species of fluke, um, different tree method that um, happens to use deer as a definitive host. Um, sheep liver fluke, this is a, just another common fluke, and again, uh, disease of livestock. And you see very similar life cycle. You see a similar life cycle that requires an aquatic snail. Um, again, understanding these life cycles is key to understanding their treatment or their prevention. And you'll see in a lot of these, they use that aquatic snail. They have a, a a big part of the life cycle is aquatic. And so these are things to think about when you've got, um, say you've got livestock and they drink out of a pond, you know, and they can defecate in the pond, they can drink out of the pond. This is potentially one, one way they could be infected by these sort of diseases. And so one way to treat it is to, you know, provide them a different source of drinking water or something like that. But that's what's really important. Um, a lot of you are be going into, a, you know, med school or going to vet school, this is why it's important to understand all these different phyla and the characteristics of these different phyla because a lot of them are parasites of humans or livestock and you want to be able to treat that. Okay, um, here's another uh, human parasite that you may have heard of, schistosomiasis. These are blood flukes. And so similar idea, you've got a, a trematode that infects humans and then it has a mollusk host um, but these live in the bloods not so much in the liver. Um, you'll notice that with this particular fluke the way it infects you is not by eating undercooked meat but actually it burrows through the skin so you can pick these up 
um, by going swimming, for example. Here's another example of a similar fluke that also can burrow into your skin. However, this is not uh, this is not a fluke that uses humans as its definitive host. It uses uh, water birds, ducks, as its definitive host. Um, however, those cercaria, you know, will still try to burrow into your skin, just like the previous example, but they're often unsuccessful. However, this will cause dermatitis, or it will cause uh, uh, irritation of the skin. And this is how you get swimmer's itch. And so if you've ever had swimmer's itch, or if you're familiar with swimmer's itch, this is, what ha this is what's happening, is those cercaria are trying to burrow through your skin, but they can't, but it inflames the skin and it gives you an itch. And sometimes they are able to burrow through, but since humans aren't the definitive host, you don't actually get, you know, catch a fluke from them. This is a fluke that, that uh, infects waterfowl. But again, you see how a big portion or most of the life cycle of this fluke depends upon water. Um, here's a really cool example, and I'm going to show you this example in a class. Um, this is a tree metode that infects um, you know, uses mollusks as part of its life cycle, just like all of them did, or all the examples I gave you did anyway. Um, so it infects snails and infects birds. Um, so the snail picks up the eggs of the tree metode by eating bird droppings, right? So that's a bird-snail life cycle. Um, but when those sporocysts develop in the snail, they develop in, the, in their head and their tentacles. And if you look at the tentacles, uh, and the antennae uh, of the snail here, you see they're brightly colored, and I'll show you this video, and you can watch this link to to see the video yourself, um, but they pulse, and they grow, and they glow almost, and it's very unique, and what this does is it makes the snail more vulnerable to being preyed upon by a bird, and it also sometimes changes the snail's behavior, so they don't avoid light as much, and so this snail is now more likely to be preyed upon by a bird, but of course that bird is part of the trematode's life cycle. And so this is really cool because, you know, we like to think of these organisms that sort of, um, you know, have behaviors that, and they're trying to do everything they can to increase their own survival, but then you get infected by some parasite, and that parasite can actually change your behavior to benefit the parasite, not benefit you. And it starts to have really cool implications when you think of things about like humans. And we have lots of organisms that live in our gut. And there might or might not, it's kind of not clear, but there's some suggestion that some of those organisms, you know, they produce chemicals. And are they you know, those chemicals can influence the brain chemistry, your brain chemistry, which can influence your behavior. And so you start to think about cool things like free will versus determinism. And you say, well, I, I have free will. You know, I think, therefore I am. And, and I, I, you know, can control my own destiny and my own thoughts. But maybe or maybe that's something in your gut making you think that, I don't know, right? And this is just way too big. A, this is way... Uh, above my pay grade, but it is very interesting, and we have lots of examples in the animal kingdom of these um, parasites that can change the behavior of their host, which will you know, hurt the host but benefit the parasite. That's really cool. This is why I love zoology. All right, so those are the trematodes. Next class, uh, monogenia. Uh, not too much to talk about here. These, unlike the trematodes, they only have one host. So they don't have several different hosts. They just have one, hence the mono in monogenia. Um, they're also called flukes, but these are not like, you know, you don't run into these. These are not as common. And these are ectoparasites. Um, I think I said exoparasites earlier, which is wrong. Ectoparasite. These are outside parasites. And you're going to find these mostly on fish, but you'll also find them on, you know, herps, some amphibians, reptiles, again, mostly aquatic organisms. And um, again, these are flatworms and they have similar mor morphology, but they're characterized by a uh, uh, opisapter. We'll say opisapter, um, which is kind of a series of hooks. And that's what they use for attaching to the host. And the you use that opisapter to identify the different groups. 
And so here's a picture from your book kind of showing that. And you can see these kind of series of hooks. And it's just designed to help this ectoparasite hold on to the outside. But again, notice the similarities in morphology with the other flatworms. Here's a fish that's got a bunch of these um, on its outside. And so again, these are all flatworms. And you can see that if you look at these little uh, ectoparasites, they have the same kind of morphology. And so um, I don't know that I've ever seen this around uh, here in Kentucky, but if you ever see it, now you know what you're looking at. Okay, last class we're going to talk about um, the cestoda. These are the tapeworms. All right. And so these are flat and just like the others, uh, but they're also very unique. Um, again, these are endoparasites, um, but they are mostly endoparasites of the digestive system. And so they don't have their own digestive system. So you remember back to the planarian, and we showed how that digestive system was spread throughout the whole body and it had kind of a more complicated digestive system. Uh, the tapeworms don't need that because they're flat. They've got a lot of surface area and they live in the digestive tract of their host. And so they can just absorb food right through their, their body wall. Um, the sort of head of this is called the scolex, and that's the part that grabs hold and attaches to the inside of the intestine of the host. And then it produces a bunch of segments, and the segments are called proglottids. And so as the um, new proglottids are formed, they're formed at the scolex. And so the tapeworm just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And then eventually those proglottids can um, produce eggs, or the proglottids can break off and 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 exit the body, but a lot of times it serves proglottids that are uh, producing eggs, and then those can hatch and go and infect new hosts. And so here's a figure from your book and showing you the scolex, um, and that's where it attaches. And then again, note the development of those proglottids. The new ones, the immature ones, are produced at the scolex, and so then, um, you know, they're added at the scolex, and so the rest of the, the worm gets longer, and as the proglottids kind of get farther and farther from the scolex. They get more and more mature. mature. And you can see down here at the, the uh, far end of the tapeworm, there's where you have a gravid proglottid or one that's going to, that's ready to reproduce and lay eggs. Um, the scolex, it's actually, although it, it you kind of think that this is the anterior form, that's actually the posterior end of the ancestral body form, if you study the history of these things. And so then that makes it homologous to this opithapter of the monogenes, right? And so this is at the posterior end also of those ectoparasites. And you see it's a series of hooks designed to grab hold. And so you see the scolex, you've got a kind of a superficial resemblance here, a series of hooks or things that are designed to hold on. And so again, this... It's just some evidence that you use to suggest how closely related these organisms are. Um, so here's a figure from your book kind of showing just a close-up of one of those proglottids. And, um, you know, you don't see any kind of digestive system. And you wouldn't think that this is, you know, superficially doesn't seem like there's much going on here. But you've got, um, you've got kind of a well-developed reproductive system. And um, it's designed to reproduce sexually, produce eggs. And that's how it completes its life cycle. Um, so here's an example of a life cycle of a beef tapeworm that uh, humans can pick up from eating undercooked beef. And so you see the tapeworm. It's very long. It's attached in the human's intestine. And uh, the farther you get from the um, scolex, the more mature. And so here you have this gravid proglottid, and those can um, break loose and carry, they can either release eggs or they can carry the eggs themselves any way that they're shed in the feces. And so then if a cow, if you, you know, use uh, human waste to say fertilize a pasture or something, the cow might ingest some of those uh, cysts or, or the larvae. And then those are going to form cysts in the meat. And then if you don't cook the meat, thoroughly and kill those cysts, that's how you can get those live cysts, which are then going to migrate to the intestine and complete the life cycle. Um, you've also got uh, tapeworms uh, from pork, 
And not only do those infect the intestine of humans, but they can also insist in the brain of humans. And so here's uh, some cysts in the brain. It's pretty gross. Um, there's also a fish tapeworm. So again, these are all tapeworms that infect humans, and um, but their intermediate host is you know either a cow or a pig, or in this example, a fish. And so again, you see just a, um, a complicated life cycle, similar to what we've seen with a lot of the other flatworms. Um, and then if the human ingests raw or undercooked infected fish, that's how you can complete the life cycle and catch the tapeworm. Um, these are famous for how long they can get. So here is kind of, I don't know if there's a world record, but this is pretty impressive. This was pulled out of a human being. This is a tapeworm that is 20 meters long. So imagine having a 20 meter long tapeworm living in you. That's pretty cool. Uh, tapeworms are very common with pets, um, certainly dogs. Um, I'll show you a video of a tapeworm larvae leaving the anus of a dog. I'll show you that in lab. It's pretty cool. Um, pretty common parasite of dogs. And you'll notice here that a flea is part of the life cycle. And so um, whereas in some of the other tapeworms, you, uh, well, uh, let me rephrase this. Whereas in some of the other um, parasites of dogs that you have to worry about, you know, they can burrow through the skin or whatever. Uh, again, this is a tapeworm, so it's all about the digestive system. And so they have to eat an infected flea. And so if they have fleas and get bitten by a flea, um, that's not how you catch this tapeworm. There are other diseases you can get that way. Um, but the dog has to eat the flea. Well, if the dog has fleas, they're going to be picking at it. They're going to swallow fleas. Or if they're outside, they might swallow a flea. Or if they, uh, you know, interact with other organisms that have fleas. So this is kind of one of, you know, one of many reasons why we try to control fleas with our pets is because they're vectors for a lot of these diseases. All right. So, um, you know, those are some of the... Uh, uh, parasitic flatworms. Uh, I just think they're really cool examples. Uh, like I said, I'll show you some videos in lab. Uh, we'll look at some some samples of these in class. Uh, if you got any questions, let me know. And that's it for the platyhelminthes. See you later.